Friends, may I speak in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. To every chorister's delight, before I dive into my sermon proper, a very brief reflection on this passage from the letter to the Hebrews. Because I hope you heard the good news, this story, with, this morning, with great clarity. So great, in fact, that I hope to, I will read it again because it is of such importance that we remember the all-encompassing love of God as reminded or reflected this morning by St. Paul. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, he entered once for all into the holy place not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Let me say it again. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. I'm sure it's not unique to the Christian tradition, but we certainly have been um, leaders in this way. That is to say that salvation is a limited gift of God. That salvation, however we want to define salvation, we can have a much broader conversation about that, but the gift of salvation is limited, shall we say, to those of us in this room. And Paul reminds the earliest Christians and us today that such an understanding of God's love is a limited understanding of God's love. For Christ has come not for you and me, but for all. So when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, he entered once for all into the holy place. May we give thanks for the abundance and breadth of God's love for you, for me, and for all. Well, as I said, that was to be a brief aside from the, the sermon proper this morning, so forgive me for adding a minute or two to our conversation. Now, <coughs> excuse me, 700 years ago, Nicholas Copernicus transformed our world. He took us from looking at the earth, looking down, and seeing this place as the center of all to looking to the heavens, where we might begin to grasp not only the immensity of the universe beyond us, but our place within it. No longer was the earth the center either of the galaxy or even of the universe. Suddenly we began to understand that we were in orbit rather than others in orbit around us. Now, it wasn't just, I shouldn't say wasn't, it isn't just our understanding of the heavens, however, that need such dramatic reorientation. In fact, millennia before Copernicus had begun, even as a boy, to be a mathematician, millennia before him, peoples of all faith, and particularly those of the Judeo-Christian tradition, were asking questions about our orientation, that is, the orientation of our human heart. For as intransient as our scientific mind may be, as difficult as it may be to reorient the earth around the sun, the reorientation of the human heart is on another order altogether. And so Jesus, some 1,400 years before Copernicus, is pointing back to the words of Moses. Some 1,000 to 1,200, 1,400 years before him. For the ancients of the Judeo-Christian tradition were already asking 
where is our life oriented? Where is our heart to be directed? You see, it is natural and remarkably easy for us to orient this way, inward unto ourselves. To think that the world, in fact, orbits around us. It is one of the hardest learnings of a child to realize that the world of his or her own parents doesn't, in fact, orbit solely around her or him. But there is another center to life. Well, that struggle of the human child is the struggle of the human heart contained. We must learn to reorient our lives. And so the summation of the law as it comes to be known, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. You'll notice that first and foremost, it is an outward orientation. Jesus, in his re summary of the law, invites us and reminds us to look outward of ourselves rather than inward solely to ourselves. And the first or the orientation that Jesus reminds us of is the orientation to God. The orientation, if you will, to life. The orientation to the creator of all that is. The heavens above, the earth beneath, the person beside us, and the heart within us. To give ourselves over, if you will. To give ourselves over. Our heart, our mind, our understanding, our spirit, and our strength to God. But it's not enough, Jesus reminds us, to look heavenward, so to speak. To look and gaze solely upon God. For in fact, if we are to gaze upon God, if we're to gaze upon either this altar, the cross that gathers us, or this beauty of this building that surrounds us. If we are to authentically gaze upon God, we must also gaze into the eyes of our neighbor. And not simply gaze, Jesus will remind us. But to stretch out our hands in compassion and care. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. Yes, love thy neighbor as thyself. These two commandments, you'll notice in this retelling that we've just heard from the Gospel of Mark, first of all, the, the, the question is which, of the, which law is the greatest? And Jesus offers two. As if they are one, there is almost the smallest of breaks, as if he takes but a pause in his sentence. To love God with all one's strength, mind, understanding, and, and love one neighbor as ourselves. To draw these two outward orientations into one. One cannot love, that is to say, one cannot love God without loving one's neighbor. For 700 years ago, Copernicus, Copernicus reorientates our scientific mind. Still today, we are working to reorient our hearts. We do this in a couple of fundamental ways. One, this time of worship. You've heard me say it over and over in the years past. There are only a few things that we are here to do as a church, and one of them is fundamentally to worship. Not because God needs our worship, but because we need worship. We need to pause our lives 
We need to step out of that center place that we so happily occupy and to put ourselves in orbit again around the Creator of all. We need to pause to see again that we are not the beginning and the end of life. we also must serve. Not only because we are called to love our neighbor, but because we have to remember that she or he is a central point in our orientation. That I must step out in order to allow another in. In order that my love may orbit not simply around me and my family and my hopes for our future, but that my heart may orbit around the care of another, my neighbor, my friend. We are called as a community. We are called to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind and to love one another as ourselves. This may be the fundamental work of the church, to reorientate our hearts in order that we might love God, one another, and the world. Amen.